Now, I really didn't come here to talk about the book much. Uh, I just want to talk about the story behind the book because that's what's important to you. It, it did hit the bestseller list last week, by the way. It's called Curse the Moon, Lee Jackson. You can find it in, in uh, you know, a soft copy. You can also see it, find it on Kindle and other places. Um, there was a guy that came to town in a, in a country, and I won't tell you which country it is just now, but uh, he's a demagogue, and he promised people everything. Believe in me, I'm going to bring you hope, I'm going to bring you change, I'm going to bring you agricultural, you're going to own houses, cars, it's all going to be wonderful. Okay, anybody got any ideas where that could have happened? It, exactly, well, you're right, and it's happened in a lot of different places. This, this book happens to be about where it took, about what happened down in Cuba. Okay, and it didn't happen to just anybody. It's not a, it's not a, uh, just a story made up. It, a lot of what's in there actually happened to my, uh, my father-in-law. Okay, so we're talking about from personal, you know, somebody that's close to us that these things happen to. It's written as a thriller, it's not a memoir, and it's not a, um, a, a history lesson. But it is a story, and in there it, it tells you how bad things can get. I mean, if you had to spend your days for six months at a time in a little box where you couldn't stand up, couldn't sit down, couldn't kneel down, couldn't lay down, didn't take you out for bathroom breaks, shine bright lights in your faces, or left you in total darkness, what, what kind of condition are you likely to come out into? That is the future that we could be facing if we don't do something. Okay? And the fact of the matter is, you talk to the old Cubans, you look at the old videos, and what you see is that Cuba was, in those days, before that time, very much like the United States, okay? It was a wealthy place. They had a healthy middle class, and a demagogue came in and sold them a bunch of goods, and they've had nothing but tyranny since then. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is um, I, I, I promised these motorcyclists that I'd mentioned, uh, I'd mentioned Harleys in particular, motorcycles in general, so let's go with that. How many are old enough? I know there aren't very many of you. I'm probably older than just about all of you. But uh, how, how many of you remember Easy Rider, the movie Easy Rider? Yeah, okay, a bunch. And do you recall the tagline on that? You know, they went, out to find, they went out to see America, and they couldn't find it anywhere. Do you remember that? Yeah. Well, you know, I took a motorcycle ride across country back in 70, well, never mind that date. That's dating me too far back. But I took another one in um, uh, 2007 across from um, uh, Montana down through Wyoming across over into uh, the Great Lakes up into Canada down uh, then came across over in New York you know through Niagara Falls and so on it's a gorgeous beautiful ride and I thought about that movie the, the whole time I was out there and so I was looking and guess what I don't know what these guys they must have blinders on because I found America everywhere Everywhere I looked, there was America. It was in the small towns. It was in the back roads. It was in the little mom and pop stores. It was in people helping each other along the side of the road. That's America. You know, Ronald Reagan once said that America, and I'm going to paraphrase this, but he said America is, is an idea. And it's the idea that people act with tenacity and responsibility. And that is what made our country great. And that's what we've got, to, we've got to redevelop and restore and bring back into our, into our national dialogue and into our national actions. Um, now then, the last thing I'm going to talk about is um, what I did uh, in my deployments. Um, he mentioned I graduated from West Point. I have twin sons that also graduated from there. And um, uh, I, got an, I, I left the Army years ago and then five, six years ago I got an email that said, would you come back to the Department of the Army and do some work for us? And, and so I said I would. So the three of us, my, me and my three sons were all three of us deployed, or two sons, we were all three deployed at the same time. Now the real hero of that is my wife and she's here. I just don't see where she is right now. She's probably hiding so that y'all don't see her. But uh, at any rate, um, uh, she's the one that had to put up with the greatest amount of, of stress. But I think what you'd be interested in is what my job was when I was in Iraq. Because it was to be out in, uh, uh, among the people, go out on patrol, go out into the villages along the streets, talk to them, find out what do they think, what are they worried about when it comes to security, and then report back to the commanders in Iraq. I was at the uh, brigade combat team level. In uh, Afghanistan, I was at with the uh, Marine headquarters in Leatherneck. Had the same, essentially the same job both places. And that is to go out and find out what people think, 
about anything that might bear on security. It's something that the commander would like to know. Hey, if, if, the, if the people are thinking, for instance, that they might not get to vote, maybe they'll start shooting. Maybe they'll shoot each other, maybe they'll start shooting at us. And as a matter of fact, the very first uh, project that I had to work on in Iraq was uh, during the first uh, provincial elections. And that was exactly the theory that we were operating under. Uh, the question was, does the population think that the election process is fair? If they think it's fair, then they're probably okay. Things are gonna be, you know, pass they're gonna be pe peaceful. If they think it's not fair, if they think that, that they're gonna be disenfranchised, then they, they might start shooting. Well, and as a matter of fact, what we found was that the Sunnis were being disenfranchised by distance. In other words, they had to go uh, quite a distance in order to be able to vote, literally walking like 15 kilometers. They take their whole families with them to do that, babies and all, because they don't dare leave them behind. Think of living in those types of conditions. Um, the Shia, they would go right around the corner, okay, and they'd vote there. The Sunnis were being disenfranchised. Well, we made some recommendations, and they went up to the uh, Iraqi high, um, election, high election committee, um, and they changed, they realigned the voting stations and they provided bus transportation in order to make sure that, that the Sunni got the vote. And as a matter of fact, it came off as a very successful election. Now, our main goal was to save soldiers' lives. If they're not shooting at us, our soldiers aren't gonna get killed. So that's why we were doing it. But it's really a good thing too if the local population isn't getting killed. Because they like us better uh, when that happens as well. And then the other thing we, we theorized was that if we could figure out those things, then we might be able to develop non-lethal approaches to, win, to meeting a military objective. And uh, the teams, and I led teams in, across five provinces in Iraq and then in, uh, in, uh, um, uh, at Leatherneck in, in Afghanistan. But in Iraq, our teams were credited with bringing the level of attacks against the brigade down across five provinces uh, down to the lowest level in several years. That's going all the way from Saudi Arabia to Ira uh, Iran. It's in the three most significantly religious um, uh, provinces in the country. And so it, from our perspective, did we, did we save any lives? Don't know, but there's a pretty good idea that maybe we, we, we did. And what we did there was actually ended up changing policy, uh, national policy inside both the government, U.S. government as well as Iraq. Okay. So those are the, the, some of the things that we, that we accomplished while we were in Iraq. Now, the, um, the reason I'm telling you that is uh, one other point I want to go before I get to why I'm telling you that. You won't hear this from anybody else in the media, and I'm not in the media, but you've heard often the Iraqis want us out of there. They don't want, they need, they want to see an Islamic uh, democracy. You know, same thing with the Afghans. I'm here to tell you, my team's talked to over 10,000 people out in the streets and the villages where they lived and worked, and that ain't true. What they would tell us was, when American soldiers are there, we feel safe. When American soldiers are there, they bring lights, you know, uh, put them up in the streets, street lights, and our days are extended, and our kids can play, and our women can go about doing their business without getting molested. Our men don't have to get worried about getting you know, limbs hacked off or heads chopped off or so on. So this notion that uh, the Iraqis and the Afghanistans wanted uh, Americans out, I'm here to tell you it wasn't true. Our soldiers did a phenomenal job over there. Our Marines, our airmen, our, our Navy, the, every, the, the entire effort was really tremendous and we can be very, very proud of our military. That brings me to the part that I said I get to do. Okay, and I'm very, very honored to do this. And that is that we now want to honor our, our veterans. So any veterans out in the crowd, anywhere, stand up, please. 